All right, here we go. Make do episode 39. I'm Nick, that's Sean. We are joined today with our special guest, uh, Grant Schwalbe, out of a sterile fire rescue in the uh, great state of Florida. Uh, currently, I believe, a division chief there in Estero, um, part of the cadre when things go bad. Uh, I believe he's founder, co-founder, Grabs Podcast. Um, so that's got a lot going on there, man. You a lot to unpack. Uh, Grant, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. So, uh, yeah, on the blanks a little bit, man, kind of talk about, you know, where you got your start in the fire service to where you're at now and uh, kind of what got you going down the road with when things go bad and uh, the Grabs podcast and all that kind of stuff. That's a lot of stuff to unpack. But, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm fortunate that uh, the only thing I've ever wanted to do is be a fireman uh, from the time I was little. Like every picture I remember, uh, you know, playing with fire trucks or having that little fire helmet that's got the uh, that's got the light uh, and siren uh, integrated into it. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to live in a small town where the, you know, the big tornado siren would go off anytime there's a fire. So I was close enough that I'd ride my bike. Uh, the guys would write the address on the chalkboard for the volunteers that would come up. So I get the address and, and go follow the fire trucks. And one of the early Christmases, my mom got me a scanner. And from, you know, really from that point I was hooked and, uh, Joined the Explorers uh, about 16 years old, um, and this was all just outside of Toledo, Ohio. And um, you know, then then uh, you know went to medical school, went to fire school, and I think it's popular up in that that uh, Northeast is to uh, just grunt and work every part time fire job you could. So I think I was maybe had 48 hours off in a week uh, between working, you know, private ambulance, any part time fire job that I could do. And, uh, you know, I landed on the, the city of Perrysburg, uh, and I think it was about 1999. I started there as a full-time fire firefighter paramedic. And then right about, um, it was shortly after 9-11, I kind of had a, a moment that I was like, man, you know, the department I was working at, we had uh, four full-time guys and who we didn't have auto aid agreements or anything. So when you got a job, you were working for a long time. And, you know, right after 9-11, I was with with my current wife and starting to think about, you know, settling down and having a family. And I was, you know, I thought like, hey, if if we get a bad fire, who's coming for me? And uh, so started thinking like, man, maybe it's time to to not live out the childhood dream of working at the one station firehouse, but uh, expand my horizon a little bit. And it'd, it'd be nice to know that I had two or three or four rigs that were coming to back me up. Uh, my mom and the rest of the family had moved down to Naples, Florida. And my uh, my girlfriend or fiance at the time was like, hey, I'm never gonna, I'm not going to live in Ohio the rest of my life. I'm going to go to Florida and you can come with me or not. So, you know, looking down in Florida, um, they had a lot of up and up and coming fire departments and the majority of the fire departments uh, didn't do transport. So I thought, man, what better place to be a paramedic on an ALS engine that doesn't transport and uh, so in 20, uh, uh, 2003, I ended up getting hired at a Sterifier Rescue. And, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I spent a couple of years as a, as a fireman. And the majority of my career here, I spent as a uh, lieutenant on Engine 43. And then most recently, about a year and a half ago, I got promoted to Division Chief of Operations and Training. And so I've just been fortunate enough to have great opportunities uh, to train, to be around people that are just the best in the fire service. And, and, uh, so it's been kind of fun. I'm living out my, my childhood dream. Oh yeah, man. That is, uh, you know, that's it. Um, you're getting to do what you love from growing up, man. And being able to, to live that is, uh, you know, truly blessed. And you think what, what we get to do, right. The thing that the things that we get to see and do and be part of, um, we're, we're very fortunate when you look at the, the general population, a lot of people hate their jobs. A lot of people hate going punching the clock Monday through Friday, and we get to go do some pretty badass stuff. So I want to talk real quick um, when things go bad. I know that's kind of where I first kind of learned of you and kind of met you in passing. Uh, you were doing work with those guys. Um, how did you get involved with that that cadre, that program, uh, and what has that kind of meant to your, your career path and, and just your mindset towards training? Yeah, so uh, 
I, I was struggling. You know, you hit a point in your career when you're like, hey, I want to give back. I want to start teaching some things. Um, and I'm not not trying to chase what other people are doing or to be, you know, a, a celebrity firefighter or something. But I just wanted to, like, I had a lot of fun training and I wanted to pass that on. So I tried to latch on to a couple different people that were teaching and just nothing ever panned out with the exception of Skip Coleman out of Toledo. And he's like OG search guy. Uh, he was one of my instructors up in Toledo and, you know, just, you know, him and I hit it off quite a bit. And I really just, I really liked how he taught the searching smarter stuff. And so, um, so he helped me kind of develop a search class. And so about, I'm, I'm putting on the search class at the local fire Academy that, that I teach at Fort Myers fire Academy and uh, a, a search class pops up in Clearwater. And some of the guys at work were, um, were talking about going to it. And I'm like, hey, you know, you know, I'll go in. I'll take this class. And we'll see what other people are teaching on search. So we go up there and uh, it's Paul Capos teaching. I never heard of Paul uh, or anything, um, but I loved his material. I love his style of delivery. And he, ha- he hung in that FDIC circle. So he was, you know, he was doing the right things. And, uh, you know, I talked to him. I'm like, hey, bro, like, I love what you're doing, but how comes I've never heard of anything that you're teaching? Uh, you don't write, you don't do anything social media wise. You're not doing any of that kind of stuff. And um, so we just started talking, talking about it uh, quite a bit. And we had an opportunity in Estero to bring him down. We didn't have any, any kind of bailout ropes or anything. So, I, you know, I was picking his brain. I'm like, what do you recommend? And would you come do an in-service with our department? So we ended up bringing him down and, you know, you bring an instructor down and, and, like a fire nerd I am. I'm like, Hey, I just want to watch everything you're doing. I'm going to just be a grunt. I'll be there all three days and I'll be whatever you need. And we really hit it off. Um, and then about a year later, we bring him back to do some survival stuff. And I didn't know, but he was kind of putting me through the ringer. He was, you know, I was, I was helping out, but then he was like, Hey, I want you to demo some stuff for me. And then, Hey, I want you to do a scenario. And I didn't know, but it was kind of like, uh, auditions. And it worked out well. So I kind of got plugged in with him and like, and the rest of those guys, uh, just, just some studs. Uh, but really I felt like my role was just to highlight what they're already doing. And I was kind of, you know, dabbling and I'm a systems person. So I'd like to take what they're teaching and put together in a system that worked for me and my department. Um, and that's really kind of how it worked. And then, uh, you know, Paul and I became, you know, real close friends and, you know, we just started doing our thing. So that's kind of how that, when things go bad, things started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, great, great training, man. I, you know, got fortunate to take some classes with Paul and those guys. Uh, you guys doing stuff. I, I believe actually the first time I, let's say it might have been Orlando Fire Conference or Massey. I'm trying to remember. It's been a while. Um, it was the first time I kind of took the class with you guys, and uh, it was truck company stuff, so throwing ladders and that kind of stuff, search, and uh, it was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, learned a ton. Paul is one of those guys that you know you meet, you meet Paul. He's like, man, he's he's got a very energetic personality and just kind of man you just feel the passion when he's teaching when he's doing stuff so um but so when did uh you know you've been doing the grabs podcast now for a little bit uh where did that all come from and and can you tell us a little bit about that podcast give a little plug for it man because i feel like uh, you guys are really doing a great job highlighting our successes uh via the podcast platform and so i just want to yeah just dive in that r- real quick and kind of what got you going down that road and and you know, um, some of the more exciting things you guys got coming down the road, maybe some, you know, if you got some upcoming episodes you want to hear, but uh, yeah, just wanted to hear a little bit about it. Cause I think, uh, you know, for anybody listening here, hopefully they're familiar with it, but if not, man, you guys uh, go check it out. I think it's really, really awesome what you guys are doing. Yeah. It's, nothing has ever planned, right? You know, you just kind of ebb and flow and you balance work and your passion in the fire service and you balance family. Right. So I got teaching with Polly and we were doing a lot of stuff. We were teaching probably more than I should have been. You know, I had two young kids at the house and I put a, a tremendous amount of the family load on my wife. And for that, I'm, I'm forever sorry because you can't get that time back. But she managed it like a champ. Um, but I, I just felt like I was kind of missing out as my kids were starting to grow older. And I said, you know, I'd really like to continue to teach. Um, but how do I pass on what I'm doing without having to be away from my family? So I'm not a podcast guy. I'm not that techie. I, I'm really kind of an idiot when it comes to all that. If anybody has ever done a podcast with me, it's, it's pretty much a joke how it gets started, right? Uh, you'd think I'd never been introduced to a computer, but but uh, so I, I, I kind of floated the idea with Kyle Samsung 
on the journeyman side of things. He was a little more, we just happened to be running into each other. Uh, I taught up at a conference that he did and I said, Hey dude, would you ever want to do a podcast? Cause I kind of feel like I know the people and I like to have conversations. Um, and, and you know, fire nerds, like how many times do you guys have awesome conversations with dudes? And you're like, man, if somebody could just be a, a, a fly on the wall to hear what we talk about, um, it give them a different perspective. You know, I was the guy that would go up to the Clada at FDIC and just grab a beer and just sit off in the corner. And I just wanted to hear the stories from people. Um, you know, so that was kind of the mastermind of trying to do a podcast. So, uh, Kyle got it kind of set up and then I'd reached out to the guys when it was early on with the firefighter rescue survey. And it, like that, was unbelievable what they're doing. So uh, at the time, um, you know, I had been teaching that first year at FDIC. Uh, it was with Brothers in Battle. It was with Gary Lane, Justin McWilliams. And uh, so those guys were starting to do that. And I'm like, hey, you know, how do I get involved? And they're like, dude, it's like, really, we've got it going and we don't need anybody else right now. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Well, if you ever need any help, let me know. Um, so really, I was just kind of a fanboy of the Firefighter Rescue Survey. But then in the same way we're doing the podcast and stuff, we're talking about how do we record a conversation with, with, you know, me and Nick or with me and Sean or me and Polly, like, how do we, how do we record that so other people can hear? And I was teaching already on the, on the search stuff. And you know, when you're teaching, you try to research as much as you can. So you hear about a cool grab, you call the guy and you're like, Hey, tell me about it. I want to make sure that what I'm teaching lines up with what you're actually doing. And then I thought, why, why does it actually need to be, third person like why do i need to tell sean's story why can't sean just tell the story and and it was like well, we'll just find a way to record it and it was kind of just uh capturing the research that we were already doing for the search stuff and you know in doing so if we can steer people towards firefighter rescue survey that's cool because you know i look at numbers and numbers mean like one thing but i can relate to a story and, you know, I think we're up to like 115 or 117 of the, the, the grabs recorded. And I've learned something different. Like everyone is just, they're a lot of same. So we can train in a, in a, we can train towards those consistencies, but there's like one little nugget that I can pick out of each one. And, and uh, so that's really how, how that, that kind of got started. You know, I, I talk with Mick Williams and he's so busy doing search culture stuff. And he's like, Hey, I'd like to do it, but like, I just don't have time. Um, and so, you know, got with Nick Ledeen. He does a lot of the firefighter rescue survey stuff. I'm like, Hey, would you record some too? And then he just got busy and I just started to find a little bit of a flow where I can record, uh, you know, a couple here and there. And as long as a new one comes out every two months or two weeks, you know, I'm good with it. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of how that, that all got started. And I love to hear that because, um, you know, I think there's a lot of times in our job where, you know, things kind of get brushed out this side, like, oh, maybe nobody wants to hear that or whatever. And then you start talking to people and you realize, like, there's there's a lot of people that do, you know, so being able to package that and give it to people means a lot. I know it's meant a lot to me over the years listening to that, um, especially like you mentioned, the firefighter rescue survey, that stuff. You know, if I would have had some of that information early on in my career, I might have made some different decisions, you know, so getting those platforms out there and, and getting people on board means a ton. So with, with that said, um, is there something in your career or whether it be teaching or, or personal that that really drove you to to dive into search and say, hey, there's got to be more to this. I, I really need to, like, get this out there to people. Uh, kind of two things. One, in 1996, we were uh, we responded to a fire and I was off. To, actually, at that time, I wasn't even full time. But, you know, I was I was a part paid guy. I always tried to find a house that was close to the firehouse. So I was guaranteed second due. Right. So the fire came in in the middle of the night and it was, um, you know, fire through the roof. The reports came in as um, nobody's inside. They'd sold the house and moved to to another city. Crews went inside, and it's not an aggressive search culture. You know, I, mean, I know Toledo's aggressive, but we were in the suburbs, so that stuff just doesn't happen, right? So the crews go inside. You know, there's no furniture or anything, so that matches with the for sale sign in the front yard and what bystanders are saying. Um, and, and then, you know, in the end, we we kind of get the fire knocked down, and there's 
a guy laying on the floor right next to the sliding glass door, not burned or anything, uh, but looked like it was, you know, overcome by smoke. Now, I don't know if we would have done the search had uh, early had it, we'd had a different outcome, but he was a young dude. He was, he was a cousin of one of the guys I grew up with. So I knew of him. Um, and I'll tell you for like the next three months, every time I went into a dark room, I saw that body laying there. And so that bugged me. I'm like, man, we suck. And then, you know, you go through training and nobody's ever really teaching you a good way of search. I mean, Skip Coleman was probably the first one that, that I heard anything about oriented search and, and having kind of a plan and dumping firefighters in, but every training I went to was, was kind of a shit show, right? The guys are crawling like in a, in a line. We're not really doing this well. And uh, I think Gary Lane says it the best, like we're finding bodies by happenstance. It's not, not that we're that good. We're just getting lucky. We happen to be uh, in a 10 by 10 room and we're looking for a six foot human being. You're just going to run across them. Um, so I, I, I kind of said, you know, the way people are teaching it, isn't how we're doing it on the fire ground. So we just need to bridge the gap and say, what are we really doing? Uh, and how can we get better? And, you know, I'm not like a, a spectacular search guy. I don't work at job town, but I've tried to pick the brains of everybody from, from Wichita to FDNY to Toledo to the small town departments. And the key thing is kind of having a plan, be willing to occupy space and just get inside. Um, and so we, I, I you know, I just need to say, how, how do I articulate that to the students and give them the confidence to actually go inside? You know, there was a, another call that happened several years later. So that was the first the first call in 96 is like, man, we need to go inside and search every time. The second time we got a call, uh, it was efficiency old folks homes. Right. We went there on medicals all the time. And sometimes it's like a, a big dude that's a CHF or and other times it's like a frail, you know, 90 pound, uh, 90 year old. So we get a call that we get a call for a fire there and we roll up and there's light smoke rolling out and you know neighbors are like she's in there she's in there she's in there and i'm like oh man i'm gonna get my grab like how can i screw this up this is a 600 square foot apartment and i cross the threshold i don't remember who my partner was but i cross the threshold and i remember thinking i don't have a plan to get this victim out so my aggressiveness scaled back so the 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 ego in me is like i don't want to find a victim and not be able to get the victim out I didn't have that plan. So I'm like, if I slow my search down enough, maybe I can come up with a plan. Or if my partner finds the victim, I can help him. But I can't, I certainly can't take lead on this. I've never been shown. And, you know, the if the third edition goes goes through my head where you got two firefighters in black and white carrying out a, a person on a chair, and then you've got them doing like, you know, a, a victim laying across three firefighters with their arms out, like, that's not going to work. Um and in the end, I was searching really timid and, you know, there ended up being nobody inside there. But in the end, I'm like, man, I got to like figure this out. And Ohio's a really big state on using webbing and just girth hitching around the body. Um, so that's what became my default until, you know, we progressed a little bit more. And now we're doing arm drags and leg drags and, and stuff like that. But um, between those, I'm like, man, we're doing it wrong. We got to get it better. So. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate you sharing those two stories with us because I often get asked that um, when I'm teaching and stuff too. Is like, hey, why? What made you want to do this? And obviously, very similar to you, right? Um, experiences when you realize, like, hey, I was kind of duped here. <laughs> I was not set up for success. And um, one of the things I found interesting in your story is you said, "I don't have a plan to get them out," and that's something that I think we as a fire service need to to truly understand, like. We spend a lot of time preparing people on search now, especially now with all these programs, but are we truly preparing them for the removal? Because if you're not capable of getting that person out, then you probably shouldn't be searching for them in the first place because you're not doing them any good, you know? Yeah. And to hear you bring that up, just, just kind of like solidifies that for me that, Hey man, there we've come a long way. Right. And we have some tremendous information out there and there's a lot of people doing fantastic programs in the way of search and our culture is changing for the better, but we still got some work to do. Um, so with that, obviously that, that situation kind of helps bring you forward. Is there any techniques, um, that, that you currently teach to help people when they find a victim of, of what your preferred method is for drags or carries or any of that stuff? Uh, 
first thing we want to, you know, once, once we find a victim, we want to let them know. I think it's kind of industry standard now, you know, victim, victim, victim. All right. We know what that mayday, mayday, mayday. We know what that is. So we know what victim, victim, victim is. Right. So then trying to let the officer know, Hey, this is your chance to remind the firefighter, look for another one. Cause where there's one, there's likely to be another one. Right. But this is this guy's first time he's ever found a victim. So decrease his anxiety a little bit, remind him to go search for another one. At that time, like the officer really needs to, to look at the conditions of the building. You know, is it, you know, if we crawl through a nasty, smoky, dark hallway and it's hot and we find Gary's mom in the back room and it's light smoke, do we want to take his mom right out the front door? No, like she was safe, closed door, safe life. She was in a safe place and we just did more harm. So we got to look at, see what the environment's doing. So maybe it's a protecting place until we put the fire out. Um, maybe it's to take her out the window. Um, you know, if conditions are all the same, we got smoke conditions the same in the room as where you are, probably get her out quickly. And I like to use, I don't like much hazmat um, about as much as I like EMS, but, uh, you know, time distance and shielding is, you know, I steal that, right? So we, if we can limit her time in the smoke, that's good. If we can keep them away from the fire, that's good. Uh, you know, distance wise, are we, what's our fastest way out? You know, maybe there's a window right here, but you know, we were doing an, a training at acquired structure yesterday. And I just, I just had guys like, Hey, break a window to the point where you'd be comfortable handing your mom out the window. And I think sometimes in training, we were like, Hey, uh, or there's a window right here. We're going to take her out the window. But when was the last time you broke a window enough that it doesn't look like that ring of fire from a circus that you'll actually hand a human being out. And so then they're like, oh yeah, man, that takes way longer. Um, and you know, if you're going to do windows, you got to know a window lift, right? So sometimes just the way you came is going to be the best way. Um, and then as far as, you know, getting the victim out, you know, it's nice if we don't have clutter, we can do, you know, an arm drag or a leg drag. I like keeping victims low. I hate that combat challenge drag because I don't know about you guys, but every time I walk backwards in a fire, I'm tripping over everything. And if you've got a victim up high and you're tripping, that victim lands on you. Now you get pinned, right? So we had a couple of the the podcasts, the grabs podcast where, where that actually happened. So uh, if the victim's already down on the ground and you get tired, number one, you're keeping the airway low. But if you get tired, you can just stop for a minute. You can readjust. You can pass off. Um, so I do like keeping, keep them, keeping the victims low. Um, but you know, you got clutter on the ground and you need to kind of have a plan for getting that victim up and off the clutter, you know, whether that's kind of a, somebody at the feet and somebody at the arms, um, you just kind of practice and kind of figure out what works for you, but, um, just make it happen. Doesn't mean we don't need to practice it at some point. Yeah. I, I love that, man. Um, you know, it's funny. You talk about having a plan and how that like that fire where you kind of search timidly because you realize, Oh man, I like, <laughs> I don't have a plan. How are we going to move this person? Um, that was me, I, you know, and I've shared my story on the podcast a couple of times. Um, and it really was my wake up call to, to train more, to learn more, to get better. Because just like you, you talk about like the, you know, the IFSTA, this fourth edition, uh, you know, that we used to just come out when I went through fire school and, but you know, the whole crawl around on our hands and knees, looking at the floor in a line, you know, and, and just, just, People always, you know, I always, I guess in my mind, um, we get kind of these built in, you know, overconfidences. Sometimes we search in these training buildings where there's very limited furniture and obstructions and obstacles and there's no carpet and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, um, minimal transitioning in floors and things like that. And, and we have these stiff mannequins and we crawl around and we find them and we put a little, you know, webbing around them and we pull this stiff mannequin out and it's, it's, you know, we build in this, this almost a false confidence. And that's what happened to me. I, I, I thought I was pretty decent, you know, and search. Okay. But you know, there's two parts of search and then there's the rescue. Once you find the victim, what's the best practice to find them. And then once you do find them, what are you going to do? And, and I realized like on that fire that I had really never, you know, I had a plan, but it was a faulty plan. And so, you know, 2012, it was Memorial day. First time I've been detailed to the truck. One of the first times I've been detailed to the truck company in Tallahassee. And, we get dispatch a fire shift change and you know there's cars in the driveway nobody knows whether he's in there he's not in there blah blah blah. engine goes in goes to the right to start uh fire attack and we go to the left basically searching away from the line on the long side of the house and uh i remember being 
first of all, surprised that we found somebody because how many times do we get told there might be somebody in there and there's no one in there? Um, and then when we found this guy, he's 6'4", 240, slimy because he's covered in soot and half naked and you know and and i remember my captain yelling that we had a victim and i like it, it surprised me it shocked me um i was like holy shit we what say what we have a victim so of course my mind you know is like going a million miles an hour and now i'm like oh shit now what well in my mind you know if i ever found a victim i was going to do this fancy hasty harness with my webbing and i was gonna it was gonna be you know stand up pull them out like good to go so i go to pull my webbing out have a hard time getting it out get it out and trying to put this hasty harness on in zero visibility pretty decent heat conditions, can't see a thing, and I'm fumbling all over. I end up dropping the webbing and have to abandon that because I couldn't find it on the floor. So then I'm like, all right, well, it's going to be a dirty drag. I'm just going to pick this guy up. Well, I tried to stand up with him. Of course, I'm tripping. I, we had a couple, you know, it was a kind of a uh, split-level house, so we had a couple sets of stairs we had to go up, like, not a ton of stairs, but, you know, five or six steps. And I'm trying to pull this guy up the stairs. My captain's out trying to crawl ahead of me, trying to find the closest way out. Um, we ended up dragging this guy through the, to the back of the house, to the Charlie side, because he felt like that was closer. Um, but long story short, sucked our master face. Like, I mean, like the last eight or 10 feet, I'm having to take my regulator <laughs> out, choking, coughing on smoke. We get to the door. I can't, you know, heart rate's so high. We talk about like the mental components, like tunnel vision, everything kind of like oh, strengthens yeah. in. I can't even take my helmet off because my fingers are cramped up from sucking between the smoke and just hyperventilating. We get this guy out, and I remember everybody patting us on the back saying, good job. And I'm like, I'm thinking, man, we sucked. I sucked. I wasn't ready for that moment, you know, and, and the guy survived. And, and, you know, in spite of the the beating the hell out of it, you know, I, I must beat that guy up a million times, dropped him three or four times on top of me, you know, uh, on it, <laughs> dropped him, drug him in weird positions, any which way I could move this guy. It was not pretty. It was not clean. It did not go in my head. Like I had this plan to how it was going to be this elaborate hasty harness, put them all in this webbing and pull them out. And that did not happen. And I just remember coming back and thinking, I've got to get better. This like everything that I've been taught to that point, I thought I was a pretty good firefighter. I was seven, eight years in the job and, and feeling comfortable with myself or what I thought were, you know, was, was solid skill sets. And I realized the stuff that I've been doing on the training ground wasn't, tra did not translate to the real world, you know, crawling around hands and knees, face down, looking at the floor, hand on the wall, I'm holding onto the boot, you know, and all this stuff and all the victim stuff like you had mentioned, uh, you know, drags, stuff like that, you know, we really had never gone over what to do with dirty drags or any of that stuff or keeping it simple. And and it just made me realize like I had so much to learn. So I, you know, that, that really resonates with me when you're talking about having a plan for how you're going to search and then how you're going to plan on moving people. And, and that plan has to be, you know, we, we what I have found is like people try to overcomplicate stuff sometimes, right? That we overcomplicate, make it way more steps and layers than it needs to be. When when your heart rate's up, you're working hard. And it's a smoke hot environment, you know, smoky hot environment. Uh, the reality of it is, the more simple we can keep it, the better. Good fundamental skill sets translate better than complex systems, right? And and the other thing, you know, I think I took away from that experience, and, and you know, and, and it sounds like you're sharing the same kind of thing is like you know thinking about how and why you're moving them where you're moving them when you're moving is it a 400 pound chf or is it a 80 pound you know little old lady is it a kid is it you know a full-size adult man i mean all those things come into play on how we move them where we move them you know how many people it's going to take to move them because i can tell you right now i'm in wisconsin and there's some there's some some thick folks up here we got some corn fred <laughs> folks i mean and, and, be, and just being completely honest like we the chances of us finding somebody that's 300 plus is very, very high possibly. And so, you know, realizing like how much you can move on your own. I think Sean, you talk about this a lot in your class about figuring out what your limit is that you can comfortably move somebody by yourself and when to say, Hey, I need help. Um, but, but, you know, man, spot on. Uh, I want your thoughts, Grant on, on, you know, when you're developing a plan with your guys, um, the importance of, first of all, walking through what that looks like, uh, based on, you know, you talk about finding multiple victims. What if you do find multiple victims? Is it better, you know, to, to shelter in place, maybe pull them in a room, close the door, wait till you get more manpower? I mean, all those things come into play, right? It's, it's not always a simple, they're eight feet inside the door, you got one victim, pull them out. A lot of times uh, you may have to find a different way out, you know, it, and it may be the closest way, you know, closest means to get it out. Maybe a window, it may be another room. Um, but I want to, you know, kind of walk through as you're building your system in your head and you're teaching your folks, 
to to plan for you know expect victims expect to make the grab and then have a plan to move them out you know what do you kind of how do you build that for your people and, and how do you in your mind process that information to to make good decisions when you're when your heart rates up when you're in those in those moments yeah i think first you look at what what are the um what are the opportunities for us to find the victims how are they going to be present and you know uh, you know i make fun of ems but i'm a medic you know i did enjoy uh i enjoy from time to time working a good medical call but you know you look on the cardiac arrest and and victims you know are typically going to be in a tight spot so they'll be between the bed and the wall in a in a single wide trailer right so you only have the option they're only head first right so I need a plan for head first drags and I need a plan for feet first drags. And, um, you know, so, so coming up with something, what that looks like. And then I need a plan in case this victim's 400 pounds. Like how do I get two dudes to be able to drag this victim out? You know, maybe it's using a Prusik, maybe it's using a webbing. You got to kind of try those things out. And then you look and you say, what if the victim's slippery? You know, you mentioned your victim was slippery, right? So we know that that's a case. So we need to have a plan just in case grabbing them doesn't work. So I look through it. I'm saying, all right, these are these are our options. And you know, I I tell my guys, you know, when when I got promoted to ops and training, I'm sure everybody freaked out. They're like, oh my gosh, Schwabi, all he does is train. There's a difference between training and just messing around and trying to figure things out. You know, I spent a lot of time at acquired structures with some awesome crews that were just willing to put in the work to say we're just seeing what works, you know, and you try a bunch of different things. You see what you like the best, and then you put it to the test in a scenario or on the fire ground. And some of those things that work well when you're, you know, on a 80 degree, nice sunny afternoon, uh, it worked well when you were just messing around doesn't translate to when your, your heart rates 160 beats a minute, you can't see and you, you lose your, your dexterity. So, um, and then you flush out what works and what doesn't. You throw away half of it and you, you start back at the drawing board. Um, you know, so that's building the, the skills. Uh, something Capo taught me early on is like you put in the work on the front end. You're teaching what you're teaching. Don't get don't deviate. If you got a student that comes in there and is like, hey, check this out, dude. Don't change the next rotation and teach what that student just showed you unless you have a chance to actually do it and and try it out um something that uh, something that i ha have learned over the years as far as teaching i never want to have a student uh come in and, and me try to narrate to him what he needs to do i would rather demo the skill in gear to the students so they know it can be done you know there's nothing that drives me nuts more than you know say hey i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna walk you through doing a uh you know accordion forward all right put the shoulder put the hose on your shoulder and grab this and then you know the student messes up and then some people will play it off as the student didn't do it right how about hey you're an instructor just show it to them and they either know it's right or it's bs um and, and it shows your willingness to fail in front of them so i think when we come up with a skill we gotta we gotta if we're gonna show it to people we gotta practice it and put it to the test um, you know, when you talk about when we find multiple victims and stuff, you know, um, one thing that I really, uh, I really like, and, and I, I got this from Larry McCormick out of Chicago was if you're in searching and you find a victim, pass that victim off to somebody. You know, if you think about, you know, most, most of our fires are like a one line fire. It's, it's flowing for, you know, 30, 45, a minute and a half. You know, once they shut that down, what's, what's that backup guy doing? searches up ahead doing their search you know you find a victim hey you know attack come on up here Pat, we got a victim you pass that victim off they can take the victim out we know who the heroes were right it, it's the truck company that found the victim but what that allows us to do as a search team is we know where we came from so we know what still needs to be searched does it, it to me it doesn't make any sense for us to abandon our search take that victim out and have a new crew start fresh you know so um you know, that's that's one of the things that, that runs through my mind. You know, if, if I got the fireman and it's up searching, they find a victim, maybe they can pass it off to me as the officer and I can go run that victim out um, and then come right back to them. You know, um, 
So just kind of some of the things that at least I've run across um, when we've tried it in training, it's worked out well. Um, and it's not anything I came up with. It's talking to to people that have, have gotten way more fires than me that they said, hey, this has worked. So, Yeah, no, that's, that's – uh, <clears throat> thank you for expanding on that because what I take away from that is um, there's a lot of variables happening, right? And we have to be able to make decisions very quickly um, and and be able to adapt – to what's happening around us. So one, one thing that I like to tell everybody is like time, right? Time is our enemy. So speed has to be our weapon, no matter what, what we're doing. So especially in the realm of search and victim removal, we need to have a plan. Uh, however, that looks for you. You need to have a plan that you can get the search underway fast. And when you find a victim, you can package them and get them out there fast, you know, and then, the quicker we can get them out there to that EMS uh, support and, and start getting all those things going, that that's really where we increase our survival odds of our victims. So, you know, that's I tell her, I don't plan on being in a burning building longer than I have to be. And I definitely know that our victims have been in that building a lot longer than we have. So you don't really have that much time. And if you look at the survey, I think it's about most of our rescues are happening between the first 10 to 15 minutes, right? Total from dispatch to finding them to removing them and all that. Like that's not a whole lot of time, you know, when you start breaking that down of, okay, what is our dispatch time? You know, our response time, like all that stuff. Once we pull that air brake and we get out there, like it's go time. You know, you, you're every time you're not making a decision, you're not moving forward to towards that victim or towards the exterior with the victim. That's time wasted. So having that practice put into play, you know, and figuring that all up on the uh, on the front end is is definitely going to make or break your success, I feel. So um, now we've talked a lot. About Wait, the, before you move off of that, I want to hit on something Nick yeah, said yeah, too, though. Ahead. Like thinking about when you're getting the victim out, how many how many firefighters does it take realistically to to get a victim out? Now, if it's a big end, you know, it might be a couple, but sure. how can that officer make this better? And, you know, I spent the majority of my career as an officer. If they got a victim, I need to locate what the exit point is. And if I can kick the crap out that might be in the way to make this drag easier. And, you know, I tell people just grab onto your firefighters air pack and help them out. Cause the last thing they want to do is drag. I mean, I know you guys have probably seen this in training, um, you know, they don't know where they're going and they drag them in the, the wrong freaking way. They drag them deeper or they drag them into another room. Like you didn't do anything. Right. Take a minute, find the exit, clear a path and yoke your firemen out as quick as you can. Yeah. I think there's the importance there of, of realizing like your crew, right? Like I, I, I could be completely wrong here, but there's never really been a time where I'm, I'm searching where if, uh, if I did find somebody that I was all along. Right. Generally, I had somebody within close proximity to be able to help me. And that's where we got to train on being the, like you said, the pathfinder, so to speak. You know, we harp on orientation, you know, maintaining that orientation all the time. Part of that is realizing like, OK, so that person who's keeping orientation, if one of you is busy dragging somebody, that other person, the best thing you can do. Like, I'll let you know if I need help dragging, but please just tell me where I'm going, you know back this way, over this way, pull stuff out of the way for me, whatever it is. Um, that's going to make life a ton better for everybody, you know? So uh, yeah, I appreciate sure. you bringing that up because I think that is something that we often do overlook, especially in the training realm of things when we're teaching search is that communication aspect that is so vital, you know, in, in any operation that we're going to do. So um, search, we talked about a little bit about that and, and some removal stuff, but I would be remiss if I didn't bring this all the way back to before we even start the search, right? Like when we show up. So what are your thoughts on a, a proper search size up, things that we should be looking for, um, you know, just kind of having that plan set in, uh, in place if, if you are showing up unseen and, and know that you're, you're probably going to be the one performing search. Yeah, so kind of how we we set it up in in Lee County is we say we don't have true truck companies, we don't have like uh, squads or anything like that. You know, we, we've got pretty much everything's an engine or a quint. So we say first arriving unit is going to be an engine, second arriving unit is going to do first two truck functions, um, and regardless of what we get told on scene, 
I'm counting on my first new engine to put a line in place between the fire and potential victims, right? That allows that second end unit to function, um, you know, with big giant search balls, right? Because you know somebody's watching your back and you know we're trying to get water on the fire. You know, you got the case study, Keokuk, Iowa, 1999. You know, they get reported victims inside and they start going after the victims rather than taking care of the fire. And in the end, you have three firefighters that perish, right? So um, we, everybody's got a responsibility. We need to make sure that they do that. But as that, that second arriving officer um, planning out my search, you know, obviously uh, we're looking to see where the fire's at, where it's been, where it's going to be going, um, but we're trying to identify that searchable space. Now it's going to de depend on your crew size too, right? So my engine, uh, you know, we rode four, but I don't take four guys inside, but I prefer to search with two. So having that plan on the outside to say, hey, we're all in on search, we're going to split, or we're going to do an inside outside team, That that's that, that play uh, or conversation that needs to happen on the front end. So typically uh, I would go in with my firefighter um, and we go in as the oriented search. So t most often I would enter in that front door. So if attack had already stretched, uh, my mindset is um, the person in the most amount of danger is going to be closest to the fire. So how do I find the fire? Well, follow the freaking hose line, right? So as I'm on my way in, how can I make that engine uh, engine job a little easier? And I, I lead, I, I, I'm a big advocate of the officer leading the search, right? Because I'm going to set the tempo. Um, I'm going to make sure we're thorough and maintain crew integrity. So I'm going to lead. I'm going to get up to that hose line, try to meet up with the engine boss. Number one, do they have enough hose? Uh, you know, if they don't have enough hose, we're in a good spot that we can give them 10 feet and then we can start our search. But at least we know they're in a good spot. Next thing I want to know is, do they got water on the fire? Sometimes, you know, you guys know it might be beneficial just to have them, hey, give me 30 seconds. Because sometimes when the fire's burning, use that glow. We don't have any steam yet. We can search that fire area real quick and then buzz out of the way. So coordinating them, uh, you know, if they're going to put water in the fire yet. And then the last thing, did they search that fire area? You know, if they've already searched that fire area, I'm going to try to make my way over to the bedrooms because that's, you know, that high, high probability area, 45 to 55 percent of the time those victims are in that in the bedrooms. Right. Um, if I arrive at the same time as the engine, um, you guys have searched behind the hose line before that sucks. So if I can get in ahead of the engine and let them know where the fire's at, it helps them out, but it lets me search the fire area without having to be jammed up by a hose. So that's kind of how I like to explain that. Um, and, and identifying, you know, um, it was us fire administration did a study and they said, uh, victims were trying to escape the fire 36% of the time. Um, before succumbing to the products of combustion. So what that means to me is from the front door to the fire, I got a 36% chance of running across the victim. Then I'm going to make my way to the bedrooms, depending on which study you look at, 45 to 55% of the time. That's two big numbers. And then I'm going to catch everything else. Um, so that's kind of how I like like to, to divvy up, you know, the one story. You know, if I've got four people uh, on my rig, we'll, we'll split search and, and you know, me as the officer and my firefighter are going to take that fire floor and then we're going to assign the other area to to my other two members um i also have the option of doing the split search and, and doing an inside search with as the officer and my firefighter and then having the engineer and that and the uh, irons firefighter be my outside team and they can do ves uh, or they can just be run in support roles so you know we talked about passing off victims before um and you know i'm a big fan of the ov and that's not just like a big city fdny term but you know getting a 360 anticipating where the where the search team is and being ready to receive a victim if we say hey we found a victim we're going to bring them out a window they can receive that victim or if i hear or if they hear victim 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 hey we're coming out the coming out the front door throw on their mask they they come in that front door we can pass the victim off to them and then we can continue on with our search. So I think it's that whole crew coordination. Uh, but that's kind of how I like to move, at least how I like to, to tell people how I like them to move through a building. I'm not a big fan of right hand or left hand from the front, front door. You know, I heard years ago, um, you know, you always go right hand. And I'm like, where did that come from? And the guy I talked to said, oh, that comes from, you know, this big city. And I'm like, why do they do that? And then I, I researched with that big, big city and there's like, well, we get two trucks to every fire. 
So first truck goes to the front, second truck goes to the rear. If everybody goes right, the whole thing gets searched. I'm like, well, that makes sense. But without the context, you think every search is a right hand search. And I kind of like to target it, you know, like I know you guys teach that same thing and look for those high percentage areas and get there. Yeah, no, I, I love that because I think one thing too, that, um, that often gets overlooked with, with all that, that training is, you know, there's a lot of theories and, and whatnot, which is fine, whatever. Um, predictable behavior patterns. I think that's what we really need to get better at is, is understanding that the human beings are pretty predictable, right? Well, when things are on fire, where they're trying to exit from things like that, where they maybe inhabit all the time that I think takes a lot of the guesswork out of it for us. If we could just understand in those situations, what is most likely to occur for them, you know, and that's providing that they're, they, that they woke up, you know, cause there's also the other study that, um, you know, it says that most fire deaths are attributed to people being asleep, right? So what does that tell you when you read that is, okay, well, if they're not up and they didn't, you know, try and escape, they're not in a hallway or laying on some furniture or something somewhere, where, where is their bedrooms, right? So as we put all those things together um, and we put that out, I think that's what that makes a successful search, but you got to know, you know, and if you're not talking about it, you're not training on it, then, then there's really no way to know. And man, we got incredible things now you know, with the UL and they can back the things that we do, why we feel the way we do. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Because I love, I love how you put that, you know, predictable, you know, predicting human behavior. Cause you're right. It's, it's one thing for me to spot out a number that's 36% of the time, 55% of the time. If you go, if you don't hear this, if you don't know there's a fire, where are you going to be? And it's at night, probably still in bed. If you're at home and you, you smoke detectors go off and you smell it, what are you going to do? I'm going to go look to see if I can put it out. And if I can't put it out, I'm probably going to be somewhere between the fire and the front door or the fire in my family. Right. Right. And if you go, Hey, um, if you can't get out and you, where are you going to be at? I'm going to be with my wife and kids trying to protect them in place. And that backs up finding more than one victim in the same room. Right. So yeah. if, if, if we start linking these numbers to the human behavior, then it's, I think it's going to make sense to guys a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, I love that point you made. Thank you. Yeah. It's just, you know, like, I don't, I don't have all the answers, man. I mess up a lot. <laughs> and I just, I just find that like for me, keeping things simple and understanding that is what makes me more successful. So trying to, to get other people to realize the same thing is, you know, Let's be honest. I think you alluded to it in the, in the beginning too. A, a lot of this is is guesswork, right? Like, hey, if I had to make an educated decision right now, this is where I would go. And that doesn't mean it's a hundred percent, right? But at least having that that know how to say, hey, I think this is where we should start, and being confident in that is is what's going to do it. Because um, even with the victim removal van, like like we we're talking about, if you're not confident in your technique, right, and you're not confident in your abilities, you're going to be very timid right? When it comes time to do that. So just get confident, you know, and, and put that all into action. So, uh, I, I think Nick, you had something you want to bring up, right? Yeah. I just want to do uh, kind of touch base. I mean, you know, what I love is the push for smart searches, right? Not this blind, you know, in this going back to fire Academy days of the left hand, right hand, like there was no real thought uh, I feel like early in my career for how we were searching, how we were moving people, right? It was just going, crawling your hands and knees, left hand, right hand search. Like that was it. The officer would say left hand, right hand. And that's what you did. Everybody crawled along the wall, branched off each other. And what I love is with like the UL and the firefighter rescue survey and all the data that is coming out, uh, we're seeing slowly but surely the search culture change in the U.S. fire service. We're seeing search decisions made with real data based on, you know, targeted searches that are data driven uh, on where we're most likely to ha have the highest yield, the most success and, and making those searches, you know, and, and choosing the right search tactic for the scenario, you know, and there, whether it's VES split search that you brought up uh, again, you know, again, they're all targeted searches based on where we're most likely to find victims, right? We're not just blindly going in and searching. Um, and, it, and it's funny that it's, it, you know, I look back on my career and it's funny to me that there's so many 
people that were teaching, just blindly teaching, like you know, left hand, right hand search, this is what you do, and blah, blah, blah. And like there wasn't really any thought process behind it. But it's like we wouldn't do that with a hose line to go find the fire, right? We're gonna take the hose line, we're gonna go to the fire. And it's it's just funny how it, it's taken the better part of the last, I feel like the last 15 years, there's been a big push to evaluate how and why we're searching and how we're moving victims. And it's awesome to see. Um, but I wanted to get your thoughts, you know, on, on the search culture in, in America right now. You, you know, there's a lot of good things happening in the fire service. I feel like the firefighter rescue survey and some of the stuff that's being put out there now uh, is is probably the most informed, uh, you know, that I've, you know, re really the last couple of years, the most informed, um, uh, you know, th well thought out methods are, are starting to, to get pushed out there. Um, and, and people are challenging what was for a long time, I almost felt like a, a law in the fire service of status quo. Of this is just what we do. If stud, you know, whatever. Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to bash uh, any, any publisher or anything like that, but there's some things that were in those texts that weren't necessarily rooted in, in sound data driven, you know, intelligent uh, thought processes. <laughs> there was things in there that were, were not necessarily best practices and so, you know, over the last, like I said, 15 years, I feel like there's been a shift, a, a paradigm shift in the American Fire Service where people want to know why we're doing what we're doing and, and be able to validate that. I just want to get your thoughts on that, Grant, on, on the search culture in America right now and some of the more promising things that you've seen uh, in recent years that, that are making us better, that are making us smarter and more intelligent searchers. I think the number one thing is, you know, we, we progress. The fire services kind of goes through its cycles and it went through its writ cycle. Everybody's teaching all the different writ stuff. And then, you know, hose became sexy, right? So, you know, Aaron Fields does awesome work and, but kind of everybody jumped on having a plan for hose, right? But the cool part about search, I feel like is when everybody started talking about search, no egos, right? Um, you know, several years ago when we did, there wasn't a search, there was one search class at FDIC. And I'm like, you know what? I want to put in for FDIC class on search, but I'm not the guy to, t I'm, I don't know that I'm necessarily the guy, the guy to be teaching it. But if I took a class, if I was going to take a search class from anybody, who would I want to take one from? So at the time I'm like, you know, I'll get a hold of Gary Lane. I'll get a hold of Brothers in Battle. And, you know, we just start talk talking with different people and say, uh, let, let's just put our heads together and, and do good stuff. And, um, you know, over the years, you know, Sean and, and Dustin Martinez and Larry McCormick and Mike Champo, like everybody's sharing what they're doing search wise with zero ego. And uh, like you hit me up, if, if you want to hit me up, you know, Grant Schwalbe at gmail.com, I will give you my PowerPoint presentation on search. Um, it's that important because I don't want to be gone from my family uh, to make to make the fire service better. Um I'll say, hey, probably come up with your own stories. You can't like tell my story. I'm sure everybody's got their own story, but but if that can help you with the framework, but you know, I know, um, you know, Sean sent me his his presentation, and Dustin, you know, there's no ego, and you know, the cool part is that I feel like maybe before social media, the the publishers had the upper hand. Cause they, they were the ones that were publishing. They were the ones, IFSTA and Jones and Bartlett and all that kind of stuff. Um, but my, now I can get, I can get eight search dudes on the phone in about 10 seconds and we can all call bullshit and then we can all share it. And you know what, for the most part, everybody's sharing the same thing. Um, a version of the same thing. We're using the, we're using our own stories, our own experiences to highlight that. But, uh, the mission is the mission is get the heck inside and find victims and bring them out. That's it. Everything we need to do needs to support the search. And if we get an all clear and it burns down, guess what? They'll rebuild it. And that's cool. Um, but I, I love the American fire service right now because, you know, the, you know, brush and the guys from firefighter rescue survey and everybody we talked about, man, I get, I get on the average, uh, you know, I, I get rescues all the time from those guys or they'll say, Hey, check this out, check this out. And it's not, we're not trying to be better than each other. It's just share what, share what it is. Yeah. That I love that. And, you know, I can test that because it was, was it uh, last year, I think you and I were in North Carolina together and um, you know, took your class, you took mine and we said the same thing afterwards. Like, man, we're saying the same thing. And so there was that that old adage of like, hey, if you get trained on on how to be 
an employee at McDonald's, you can go wherever you want in the country, work at McDonald's, and it's going to be the same way, right? That is, that is not necessarily the case in the fire service, but I think we're starting to inch that way with all the great things that are going on and, and the willingness for people to say, hey, we have to have best practice. We have to set the standard. In order to do that, we have to do that together, right? I can't be everywhere all the time. Grant can't be everywhere. Nick can't be everywhere. Like nobody can be everywhere all the time. And if, if your purpose for doing things is strictly, you know, monetary, then, uh, <laughs> you, you know, there's, there's lots of other jobs. You're going to get far more money. I promise you. Uh, so dropping that ego and, and realizing like, there's a lot of people out on, uh, in the fire service out there teaching right now that truly give a shit about this job. And they truly give a shit about the civilians that they swore to protect and, um, you know, just pumping it out there. And it's, it's just amazing to watch and know that we're all on the same page for the most part, you know, and, and, and challenging the status quo and saying, Hey, this, I get what you have to learn as a, as base level knowledge in the Academy and stuff like that. But there's so much more real world experience and knowledge out there that, that you can get and people will give it to you. You just have to ask and you'd have to, you know, just be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to see what happens, you know, in the next decade and, and everything else like that, because this thing is just taking off full steam. It is. And, you know, I, you know, I've mentioned Aaron Fields and Nozzle Four before, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say, I think he really laid the groundwork for how we're teaching stuff now. And you need to lay it out in an intelligent way. And you break down the skills. Uh, number one, you got to define the skills. So we're all using the same terminology. You know, when when Justin and Search Culture was putting out victim, 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 we all just embraced it. We didn't we didn't say person, 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 because we want to be different. Right. <laughs> we, all right. That's cool. We're on board. Um, and, and there's no ego. So it's just hey, let's subscribe to what's best and, and share. Um, and then when we find these skills, let's break them down into small pieces and then gradually put them all together. Um you know, so I, I think Aaron has done so much, not just for Nasa Ford, but just in the, in the way we teach stuff. Um, so that, that's been cool. But, you know, you bring up a good point. And, um, you know, Sean, how old are, how old are you guys? It's, uh, 37. What about Nick? Nick? I'm muted. <laughs> uh, 36. <laughs> All right. So, and then I'm 47. So you look and say, hey, um, we didn't have this information when we came in the fire service. You guys have been on the job for a while. Um, and so I, can you imagine how much better the fire service is going to be? These young guys that are getting this information in year one, two, three, man, I hope, I hope they blow us out of the water. Um, so, so as senior men now, I think we need to, you know, I'm not looking forward to being out of the fire service, but I need to, I need to be, you know, I think collectively we need to be passing this information on. And it's one thing to go out and teach, but it's another thing to mentor somebody else and say, hey, you're going to do little nuggets of this thing because the search, whatever we're teaching, can't live and die with we're out on the circuit. <laughs> you know, we need to we need to to bring up these young people. And then someday we're going to sit back and, and and, you know, be drinking coffee. And we're going to see these young guys that had taken classes from us that are like, man, they're doing it and they're they're, they're promoting. And man, I cannot wait to see where this fire service goes because it, it's it's exciting times. But we have to embrace that and and not get, uh, you know, not get ego driven and say, oh, we were the best ever. We ain't that good. <laughs> you know, we only got what information people are willing to share with us and our and our small sliver of experience that we have over the course of our career. No, you're absolutely correct on that. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that might think differently of uh hey this is mine you can't have it and i don't think anything in the fire service is proprietary you know i i think it's it's all derived from from us learning things and and you're absolutely right like i started the fire service in 2004 it's not to say this information wasn't out there it just wasn't being shared freely with me so i really didn't know anything other than what i was taught either at the fire academy or at the firehouse by my officers and and, and the rest of the crew and Man, it's like 10 years into my career before I realized, like, I don't know shit. Hell, I mean, I can argue right now that I still don't know shit, <laughs> you know, and it's just one of those things that like, man, if this is truly what we believe in and and, and we, we really want to see this fire for service propel, I truly don't believe the future's in, in us. I, I don't. 
I think we're just laying that groundwork for others to, to realize it's okay to say, I have something to say, and I'm going to go out there and, and make this better. And, uh, you know, anybody who's offended by that, we don't need you. You know, that, that's not the point of this. The, the, the point is when you mentor somebody and you give up that knowledge and experience that you have, that they far surpass any expectation, you know, that maybe you ever had for yourself. Who's the guy, and I'm drawing a blank now, but he wrote, he's from Michigan, and he was the first one that I really remember putting out uh, a ton of uh, a ton of good information and sharing it freely. Oh, he wrote the like the journeyman firefighter uh, manual, and it just had a bunch of good stuff. You, you, you guys got to help me out here. Oh, I don't. Was does he have a training company? Uh, I, I can't even remember now. This is horrible. This, <laughs> I should have just shut up rather than be the guy that can't remember the guy's name. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is recent. Even the no, past couple it was years, probably probably ten years ago, he was putting out the putting out putting out the information. I'm going to find it Dude, before we're no. done, unless you guys cut me off in like the next two minutes or something. No, 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 no. Find it because the only person that and, you know, gosh, I should probably know this too, but the only person that comes to mind is uh, Sean Wilson. You know, that's it. It's Sean yep. Wilson. Yep. Yeah. Search and destroy. Yep. 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 Man, that smart guy. Yeah, and he, you know what? He works right down the street. I live in Clawson. He works for Royal Oak, which is like that's why I brought it up. That's yeah. why it made sense. <laughs> yeah, but he was yeah. one of the first dudes that was like, "Hey, this is what we're doing," and shared it freely. Um, and so I appreciate Sean for doing that. Yeah, no, he he's definitely jam up. So, yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if if the end goal is to truly do this for them right and we're doing this to make the fire service a better place man nobody's self-built nobody everybody has people who help them teach them and you know give them uh things to think about to train on to work on um we learn things from each other right that's that's the beauty of the fire service is the, the network that it is um and especially with social media and the internet nowadays we can share information at you know the, the speed of a click you know and it really has transformed, you know, the information sharing is out there. People just have to avail themselves to it. But at the end of the day, like what is so awesome to see, like you said, no egos, man, people freely sharing information, sharing data, uh, sharing material to, to make us better so that we can execute our mission. Cause I mean, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if my house is on fire, I hope to hell that the people that are showing up are, are following best practices, are training, are, are, you know, looking at the data, are, in shape, ready to go. Like that's what you want showing up for your family. And that's why we, we should be, you know, everything should be driven on, on what's best for the, the citizens that we're protecting because that's somebody's family, right? That's somebody's mom, you know, wife, kid, father, grandfather, whatever. And, and, you know, if we do it with that in mind, like everything we do, every decision we make should be driven on what is best for them. And, that's that's it the bottom line and i think what the beauty of it is is like there's a lot of guys that are realizing like hey you know the more we work together the better the fire service is the better the next generation is going to be and like you said grant these guys coming in the door with this information being infused from day one how much farther along are they going to be 20 years from now than we ever could have imagined being and, you know if we keep down this this road of truly challenging our positions and challenging each other to be better and to find what is absolutely best, you know, not based on anecdote, not based on, I think this, I think that, but what is actually effective, what is actually working, man, like that's, that's a, you know, we, we have a very bright future if we continue down that path. You know, I think really the only way that we, we you know, the momentum stops is if we stop it, if we let our egos get in the way and people get caught up in, in, you know, that's mine or that's mine, or, you know, that's his or theirs or whatever. And, not sharing that information, you know, hoarding that information. I remember coming on the job, uh, all, you know, my first captain telling me to share, you know, share what you know, share what you know uh, with new guys coming in underneath you as you move up and and don't hoard that information. You know, we used to hear that in leadership stuff all the time, you know, people that you got these guys that have all this knowledge, but they don't share it with the next generation because they feel like it's a power thing. And like, man, it's no different in, in the instructor world, in the, you know, podcasting, teaching, uh, you know, whatever you're doing in your department, writing articles, like the whole point with every bit of that, the whole reason why we're doing this today is to hopefully encourage other people 
to learn and to grow and to be better, to share information, to keep that information moving. And, you know, that's that's it. You know, we, we have the opportunity as the fire service now more than ever to band together, work together to to really be a results driven business that we, that we should be right. That's everything we do should be results driven, uh, people driven, you know, for them. And I to me, that that's encouraging. It's encouraging to see, like you said, I just hope that that continues and that the guys that are coming up in the fire service now will realize what an amazing opportunity that they have to really take us to places we've never been before, to take it to the next level, to take the stuff, the, the groundwork that's been being laid for decades now with other guys and, and continue to build on that. Right. And, and to make us better. Yeah, no doubt. You know, just keeping egos out of it. Um, you know, I, and how do you check, how do you check yourself to make sure you don't have the ego going? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. And I, I think it's just sharing freely. You know, if somebody asks if you can help them out, cool. Um, you know, I talked a little bit before about, uh, you know, the grads podcast and, and um, at one point, maybe it was 10 or 15 episodes in, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really a tech guy, but I had the opportunity to try to figure out like how many downloads are we getting? How many, like, um, so we, we looked and I'm like, okay. Um, and I had to have somebody help me. So just so people know, like I have zero idea how many downloads I have zero idea, anything about it. I, for all I know, nobody even really listens. Um, so I don't have a way to figure that out. And we talked, um, early on to say, Hey, we're never going to go get a sponsor or anything. Cause we want to keep the mission pure. And the only thing I really know, um, is that, you know, guys get a hold of me. I'd love to record the grabs podcast. Um, and, um, but I'm not. I'm not like a well oiled machine. So I'll do like three or four or five in a week. And then I won't come back to it for like another month or two. Um, and you know, you just, you get busy. Um, you know, I, we kind of Brent mentioned it before. I'm about a year and a half, almost two years into a new position. Um, I'm the, uh, division chief of operations and training. Yeah, I'll tell you what a freaking difference from being on a fire truck and uh, not in a good way. It's, it's different. I love being on the rig. Um, but at some point I had to look and say, what's best for my family and my longevity in the, in the game, you know, 47 years old, I don't recover quite like I used to, you know, you have a busy night. Um, now, I love nothing more to get than to get inside and, and do work. But, uh, you know, we talked about passing it on to others. And at some point, I love seeing chiefs step up across the country that guys that are into the job, Mike Salzano, uh, you know, Shannon stone, DJ stone, um, you know, Brian brush, all these guys that are, that are making the step to chief. And you think, how cool is it that we got all these hard chargers that were on the line that are now in positions where they can make a huge difference. Um, but it, it's just different. And I think putting your ego down and saying, how can I help my organization, all the guys that want to do that in my job, how can I make them successful? And so that's kind of setting them up with, with a rough syllabus, teaching them how to teach and then letting them do it and not get in the way and say that this is my way or my thing. Um, you know, so, so that's tough. Um, that's one of the tougher things that I found, but, um, on the, on the other standpoint, you know, I've, I've kind of fallen off a little bit on like the social media and putting a lot of stuff out there. And it's not cause I'm not into the job, but I've been given an opportunity to make a difference in my own department. And I know one of my frustrations, um, early on that I talk with other people is like, Hey, my chief is all over the country teaching a bunch of things. Why wouldn't he do the same thing in my own department? Um, and so, you know, really challenge people as they promote, make a difference where you can. And that's in your own department first and giving your guys first. So all that to say, if you're trying to get a hold of me to record a podcast or to get a video that I've done or a, or a, a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll get it to you. Just bear with me. I'm not trying to blow you off. I'm not trying to be a jerk. Um, I'm just trying to be present with the people I'm present with immediately. And periodically I come back to those things and it may be a month, but I'll get that stuff to you. I promise I'm not trying to hoard those things, but uh, yeah. So jump down that little rabbit hole there. For no, a no, that's good. You know, and, and it's good to be totally transparent like that, because I think a lot of times people don't truly understand all what goes into it. You know, like, Hey, can you come here? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, and although we want to and do this stuff, like it's very time consuming. It's a hardship on, on, on your family, 
uh, especially if you do it uh, pretty consistently. Uh, I, I've learned that lesson <laughs> the hard way. Um, so, I mean, I have the same struggle. People reach out and they're like, hey, I emailed you like two months ago. I'm like, man, I am really sorry. But, you know, as, as much as we love the fire service and, and doing that and sharing that knowledge, like we have to be intentional about the time we spend with our family because uh, I know, at least for me, when I first started to to get out there and teach on the circuit, um, my youngest was three and now she's 10. And it just, boom, just went by like that. And uh, I I can't tell you, man, <laughs> like you said earlier, you can't get that time back. And uh, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. You like to think that all your time away was worth it and it made a difference. But at the same time, man, the, the biggest difference you can make is right there in your own home. And if you're not there to help out, then all of this means nothing. You, you know, know, you want to know something really scary. My oldest is in high school now. My youngest just hit middle school. And and if I've got four years with her living at my house, that's roughly 50 weekends a year. I got 200 more weekends with my daughter. <laughs> you yeah. know. Uh, so she gets it. My wife gets it. And my other daughter gets it. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean I'm not going to teach anymore, but they're going to be my priority. And you know what? Uh, when they move out, if the opportunity is still arise to uh, arise to to share, cool. And if not, if I'm irrelevant, you know, the, there'll be there'll be something else. It's it's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the I guess the biggest point is, right, like um, this stuff doesn't define you. Right. Like teaching and, and, and doing all that other than sharing your passion, like that doesn't define who you are as an individual. That's, that's, that's a small fraction of, of who you are and what your responsibilities are. So um, I, I think people really need to hear that message too. Cause, cause I, I feel like there's some people that are struggling with that balance of uh, how do I do both? You know, I, I really want to do it. And, and it's really simple, you know, to me, like the fire service is always going to be here, do what you can when you can, but uh, make sure you prioritize your family because you know, they'll, they'll be the first ones. Your kids will be growing up or, or maybe you'll come home and your wife's like, I had enough. You're never here. So what's the point? So you got to prioritize your, your family life above anything. Yeah. 100% man. Um, there's definitely a balance there. And I think like anything in life, there's seasons, right? You have those seasons in your life. Um, but there has to be the balance, right? At the end of the day, um, and finding ways to, you know, capitalize on those moments you do have and, and taking the opportunities you do have to share and, and pass on the passion. But I think that goes back to mentorship too. And is in you know, each generation, um, guys kind of passing that baton, that torch, you know, not saying you're not in, involved, but maybe you're, you're doing more stuff behind the scenes and you can transition to, you know, kind of giving them the lead and letting them run with stuff. And, and we've seen it with a few different, uh, you know, programs that I can think of in, in, in you know, my short time in the fire service. I mean, I, I look at, uh, like Eric Wheaton with Ben Inner Search, you know, and and kind of that torch that was handed to him to take that baton and run with that, and and where they've gone with can confidence and all that stuff, and and you know the goal should be hopefully to to continue, you know, one day he's hopefully will pass that baton to somebody else, right, and that'll be somebody else's baby, and that's I think that's where we have our most you know biggest impact is when we can help others be better to the point of even when they're better than us and they run with it and, and, and make it theirs for a season. And, and then, like I said, pass to the next generation, the next generation, the next guy. I mean, I had this conversation not that long ago with uh, Dustin Martinez with Mafsi and um, you know, and some of the things, you know, he's taken kind of a step back with another baby on the way and things have kind of changed in his life. He's a captain now there in Cobb and, and things have kind of, he's just kind of, his priorities have shifted a little bit. He's still involved very much with the fire service, but but he's kind of stepped back from some of his more prominent roles with, with Massey and some of the other things going on, still helping, but other guys are running with that torch now. And, you know, having that conversation, man, it just kind of sinks in. You realize like, Hey, you know, uh, none of this is forever, right? We're all, we all have our windows of opportunity, so to speak to, to, uh, you know, make a, a small impact, hopefully for the better. Um, but, but don't let that define you because, you know, you're first and foremost at home when, when, when you hang up the helmet, and you put, you know, you put your boots up for the last time. Um, think about it, man. I mean, like, who's going to be there? You know, it's going to be your your family, hopefully, first and foremost, the people who have been there all along and, and you know, a handful of good friends and stuff that transcend the fire service. But, but I mean, like, like I said, I mean, we're going to all retire one day. We're all going to step away from the job one day. And hopefully uh, there's people there to share it at the end. And, and, and we really, you know, keep that in perspective with whatever we're doing. Um, whether it's, 
you know, podcasting, training, writing, whatever, um, you know, take those opportunities seriously, but, but at the same time, don't forget to take your, your, your faith and your family and the things that the other parts of who you are, um, because who's going to, you know, at the end of the day, like, what are you going to be remembered for? Right. If, you know, what, what good does it do if you get to the end of the road and your kids don't want nothing to do with you because you were never there or, you know, your wife left you because you just were never there and, and you're all by yourself on an island at the end and they give you a plaque and say, congrats, thanks for being here. And, a week later, somebody else is in your seat and they're moving yeah, on. Great. You can teach every weekend because your family isn't around anymore. Like, that's not winning, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, you brought you brought up Eric Wheaton and, you know, he's been with me since the beginning of uh, of our hot class at, at FDIC. I remember walking around the, the showroom floor and we said, hey, I'm going to put in for one. You put in for one. If you get it. I'm going to take you. If I get it, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to you're going to come with me. And um, and I got I got a little luckier than him right at the beginning. And, and we, you know, we, we've done FDIC for quite a few years. And then this year, uh, you know, Eric's got his own hot class and he's doing uh can of confidence under life fire. And, you know, a little reluctance. He's like, man, you know, I, I like what we have. And we, we had good conversation. I said, bro, like, this is awesome. This is multiplying. And, and you go over and you do that class. And now instead of having, you know, 10 guys, we've got 20 guys that we can mentor and think of how many opportunities you're letting guys, um, you're letting your guys learn from you. And it, the point is to multiply what we're doing. Um, you know, if we can do that, I think we're winning. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, let me see here. Sorry. Um, no, a hundred percent, you know, strength in numbers type deal. Right. And, and, and that, that's really all it is. And, and I know even when, when we go out and we, we teach some of our stuff, um, I have people come up all the time like, hey, do you need anybody on the cadre? And I, and I might not, but I always say like, hey, if you're here, you know, I could definitely use a hand, you know, I'll, I'll put you to work. And I try and give people those opportunities because I know like I was given that opportunity, you know, I was that that young kid chomping like, hey, let me just show something like, you know, and, and it took somebody to say, OK. So now I, I, I do that for others because I feel it's, it's my way to give back. It, I have an obligation. The fire service has been incredibly good to me. Um, and, and I just, I want others to be a part of that too. So, you know, you never know who you're giving that opportunity to and, and where they're going to take it. So I don't know. I, I would say, don't be so reluctant to tell people, no, you know, if they're really truly there and they want to, they want to learn and they want to share something, just let them have at it, man. Yeah, and it's different from letting them be around and see how you do things. And maybe you need help logistically with cutting pallets or, or uh, making smoke or something like that. Uh, you know, we all, that's how we all, I think, feel like got our start, you know, listening to, to the big guys do their thing. But then on the flip, you know, if, if we're leads, don't put them in a spot to uh, be outside of their comfort zone. Give them some little spots to say, hey, dude, will you just go over the ha- just go over the head first drags with these guys and give them yep. some little things so they can have confidence and gradually give them bigger, bigger roles. And that's not because we're better than them. It's just baby steps so that they get the confidence. Because uh, the worst thing you can do is is put somebody in front of a group and you know <laughs> you get one student to challenge them and you will crush them for the rest of their life. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know it's not good. <laughs> no, no, it's it's definitely definitely got to be done in baby steps, you know. But taking that first step forward, because I, I mean I can't speak for everybody, but for me I was very particular like how I wanted things done, you know and. And, you know, this sounds like a, li- a little arrogant, but I was like, nobody's going to do it better than me because this is what I do, you know? And it took me a while to realize like, man, there's, there's people that <laughs> they, they have what it takes. I just got to let them, I got to let me get comfortable with that and like do it. And, and now there's guys that, that teach with me that I'm like, I don't even need to be there. I'm like, you good. Awesome. See ya. I'm walking away. And there's freedom in that knowing that like you could, trust them in that they got they got the helm they're going to do things and then you can actually go talk to students one-on-one say hey man what'd you think well you know how can i help like and you you're just taking on a different role and, and continuing that ball forward so um yeah just there's something to be said about earning your keep i guess if that's what you want to call it but there's a lot of people out there you know just just got to give them the opportunity yeah 100 percent, man um you know, we talked about this a little, our, our last episode with Steve uh, this morning, you know, about just people willing to put themselves out there, willing to take that first step. And sometimes it just takes a little nudge from 
from guys, you know, above them, you know, mentors or leaders or people in their life to kind of give them that nudge and that confidence, give them that little small piece to build confidence. And man, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take, right? That's that, that saying that's been around uh, for, for a while, you know, and not to, to bastardize the, the quote, but I mean, really and truly um, people, Sometimes just need that little vote of confidence from guys to like, hey, you got this, man. Share your passion, share your knowledge, and and give them that that first initial nudge to take that leap of faith. And and who knows, who knows where to go? I mean, right? You you give that guy the nudge, and next thing you know, uh, they're crushing it. You know, five, ten years down the road, they got their own program, they're doing the thing, and that's that should be the goal, right? Is guys to continue to pass it on. But but you know, I think it, it behooves us as instructors, as as guys, you know, the longer we're on the job. Um, to pay it forward, to give those opportunities, to create those those places where people can shine and and you know where they can really um, you know start to to progress uh, into a more you know lead role in various you know capacities within our fire departments, within our you know within our our you know teaching cadres, whatever it is, uh, whatever programs you're doing, really you know when we are gone. Uh, if it if it's if it all the knowledge and, and all the skills go with you, then it, really did you do anything? You know, if it's not getting shared and passed on years after you're gone, then really, I mean, what kind of actual difference did it make if if you take it all with you? So uh, to me, like the the future of the fire service is 100% on us first and foremost to give that information out and ensure people are ready to take those roles when we're gone. And then the other thing is like for the people coming in to realize like don't be afraid to step out. Don't be afraid to raise your hand and say, I want to be part of this. I want to do something. Um, and that is the balance, right? And so we, we need to encourage that. We need to give the, the tools and the resources and then get out of the way. Like Sean said, once they have the tools and resources that know how to do it, let them do it, man. Let them, let them, lo- you know, love it and give it to them, give them that responsibility and let them take it to the next level. And, you know, I, I've been blown away. People will surprise you. It really is truly amazing to watch people you know, you get those little baby steps, those little nudges, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, they are full tilt ahead and they have 100% buy-in in your departments and your, you know, whatever you're doing. You know, when they get that ownership and feel like, man, I, you know, I'm contributing, I'm doing something, and they they believe in the mission and what you're trying to do, man, it is amazing what people are able to do when when they just get that little bit of encouragement, that little bit, you know, that little nudge, like I said, to take that initial step uh, and then have people that believe in them, you know, mentors that invest in them and teach them and, and show them the ropes. That's, that's the way, you know, I mean, you look at the fire service over the last 200 years. I mean, that stuff, we talk about mentorship and, and the senior guys passing it on. That's what it's about. Like that, that's how you build, you know, a legacy. You want to build a legacy, invest in people, you invest in people, let, you know, let those people have the tools and resources to win and get out of their way and, and let them do their thing. And, and I mean, man, what a beautiful, you know, beautiful picture, man. When we talk about, you know, paying it forward, Sean, uh, Grant, both of you guys are doing just that, right? Giving you guys resources to win. And, you know, Grant, obviously you're in a position now as a chief uh, where you, you kind of mentioned you kind of focusing at home and, and doing those things for your department. Man, that's what it's all about, right? Because hopefully the guy that takes your place one day has the same mindset to, to invest in that organization and its people. I'm never leaving. <laughs> I'm, I'm staying right here forever. <laughs> No, but like Chief Rhodes says it good, you know, if if I can, you know, we got 600 pounds of dirt that we got to shovel and I can shovel 100 pounds a, an hour or I can get 10 dudes that can each do, you know, 60 pounds. We can move that much quicker. So, you know, hey, we got to get over our egos and stuff, but eventually they'll be better than us. But mobilize your people. man. Collectively, we're going to do good stuff. Yeah, I agree. A hundred percent. So we've had you for about a little, almost, almost an hour and a half now. So I want to respect your time. I know, I know you're working or I think you're working, right? I'm I'm here. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Okay. All right. Uh, So we're going to do the last little bit here of uh, that rapid fire, right? The the questions that we have. So um, I just got three for you no rush, take your time, expand as much as you want on it. But, uh, number one being, um, do you have any advice or what advice would you have? I should say for those who, who want to share their passion, who, who want to get, you know, forward with things and, and, you know, be out there and, and maybe develop a program or whatever the case is. 
uh, start small, uh, start with an hour program and do that in your own department. Um, I know a lot of us started teaching because we didn't have a voice when our, within our own department. Um, so, you, you know, you look at some of the best instructors all over and you go, oh man, what you're teaching is awesome. Um, I bet your department loves you. And they're like, they don't even let me teach this stuff. Um, so if you have the oppor opportunity to pour into your own guys and pour into your own department, certainly do so. If you don't, uh, find an organization like the Fools. Maybe you can find, um, you know, a neighboring department that might want it. Start teaching at a fire academy and just start small. Small, um, you know, if if and it's not going to be perfect to begin with. I mean, if I look at my search class. I, I got turned down probably I think like twelve times for FDIC, and I was heartbroken every time. And then I look back and like, man, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. And every time I got turned down, I went and I reevaluated it. I taught it about six other places. I tweaked it, and uh, just keep making it better. Um, and, and you know, you'd be a fool to think you you might be passionate about search now but if you keep trying and you keep tweaking your class think of how much better that class is going to be in in five years if it's not any better you suck and probably shouldn't be teaching um but embrace the opportunity to to get it wrong uh, so awesome yeah that's definitely sound advice um you know and, and i think we're getting in a better place i think more more places are are allowing uh people to have a voice and and share their passions so that's also good to see but um, so, uh, obviously you're big into training as, as well. So what are you, uh, what tips would you have for anybody who, who is in, in charge of training or putting it on, you know, at any level, it doesn't have to be a training chief or anything. Just if, if that person is being tasked with putting on training, what, what would you advise? Best practice, find, seek the best practice. And, uh, if you look at my training schedule year after year, it's pretty boring. Uh, first quarter, we're doing engine company operations. Second quarter, we're doing truck company operations. Third quarter, uh, we're doing our spec ops. And fourth quarter, we finish up with written survival. Every year, uh, the material is what it is. And uh, because I, it, we don't got to be fancy, but if you get good doing the basics, uh, you know, then you're going to be good. Um, when you're teaching, when you're doing a training evolution, I think less is more. Uh, something I've I've tried this year, you know, uh, doing some engine company operations. If we're doing rig to door stretches, the guys are going to have to stretch off of the rig because that is what the objective is, right? But then next month we're going to do door to seat. So when the rigs roll into the training center, I don't need them stretching rig to door anymore. I have a hose laid out. Um, so all they do is they pull up, give me your engine, give me water, and we do the drill. So breaking it down into small tasks, um, keep the drill at like 45 minutes and then have water for them to leave. And, you know, when we go out and teach, you know, we've had, we've had, we've been blessed. We've had a Ruby Tuesdays acquired structure. And then we had five acquired structures in, uh, in our neighboring district. And when crews roll in to do their training, I have spare bottles for them. Cause when they go do the training for an hour, when they leave, I don't want them to have to go back to the headquarters to fill up with, with, you know, now they got to get cleaned up. They got to get air. They got to get to the grocery store and our heat index is 106 this week. Right. That's, that's horrible. So, um, do the things you can to make it short. And, you know, I, you know, I was talking with Sam Hiddle not too long ago and, you know, people don't want to fail. And if they don't do well, don't call them a bunch of idiots. Try to break it down. People want to be successful. And we hit it before. Tell them what you want them to learn, demo the skill, let them do it slow, and then gradually increase. And the goal is just have them get a little bit better. And if we get 1% get better every day, you know, uh, you're going to be winning, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's that, that whole like 1% mindset, right? Hopefully at the end of the year, be 365 times better. Right? That's what they say. Something like that. I'm terrible at math. I don't know. If you're a firefighter <laughs> schedule every third day, maybe yeah. 120% better. But, yeah, see, see, there you go. <laughs> so, all right. So last one for you. Um, obviously, I know that uh, you've been hitting uh, FDTN pretty recently, which is awesome to see all your experiences and everything. Um, what uh, What is your favorite part of that experience uh, overall? Sets and reps. I mean, he's... Uh, Jim's got a great setup out there. Um, the fires are unbelievable. You know, they say it's like Disneyland for firefighters. It really is. But the caliber of the instructors that are out there, best practice is best practice is best practice. Right. And then when you go out there, uh, you know, who gets 40 fires in a week? 
right? So the cool part is, is you can make a mistake and you don't dwell on it. 15 minutes later, you're going to be getting another bottle. You're going to be rolling in on another fire and you're going to try not to screw it up. And you may screw something else up. But in the end, if you can make it, uh, you know, I got, I got how many years of experience in one, one, one week going out there. And so I, we got to, I got to go with a crew of guys that I teach with locally and we made up an engine crew. So everybody took rotations of being uh, the driver or the firefighter, or the Lieutenant or, or, or the irons firefighter. And then uh, when I got promoted, you know, it's not sexy, but I went for fire combat and I wanted to go to the battalion role. It's like, when do I, when, when do I get a chance to, to do uh, you know, 40 fires and learn from some of the greatest in the fire service and, you know, to, uh, to be alongside of those guys and, and just have them teach me things. You know, something as simple as, as, uh, you know, I didn't get to do all the fun stuff that killed me seeing all my guys go inside. Like I wanted to just go in on one fire. Um, but, but in the end I got better at being command, something as simple as standing on the hose line as command that I don't need to hear water on the fire. Cause I can feel it jumping. So then I'm instantly cued on. That's not, that would have taken me three years to figure out in my own department. Um, But, you know, we've got, we run tablet command. We've got all sorts of command boards. I tried everything when I was there. In the end, you know, a three by five note card, I could run anything. And, uh, you know, I've brought that back and it's helped quite a bit. Awesome, man. I appreciate you sharing that experiences or those experiences. Cause I know there's many that uh, be apprehensive about going to a place like that, you know, of, Oh, I don't want to fail in front of all these people and all those things. And, you know, it sounds like that's not even what it's about at all. You know, it's more geared towards how to make you better. And, 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 and a good you got to go to the right mindset. You know, yeah. I mean, those guys are second to none. It's expensive, but it's just hands down the best opportunity you're ever going to have. And believe me, you are not going to impress them. And they'll tell you that from the beginning, don't try to impress us. Cause we ain't going to be impressed. And I'll tell you, you know, I thought, you know, I'm teaching search. I think I'm pretty good. I remember the first time we went in, uh, in the, the, uh, the ranch with the basement, I came out, I think I had tears cause I'm like, I suck. I couldn't even find the freaking stairs in this place. Um, and it was hard, but you grow in that hard, hard times. Right. And I'm not saying I'm, uh, I'm top shelf firefighter, but I'm a heck of a lot better than I was before I ever went there. And, uh, God willing, I'm going to keep trying to go back. It, it, so kind of my rule now that I'm I'm in in ops and training is I don't get to go on the fires anymore. But if I can take a group back to FDTN every year, I'm going to go play fireman now. I did the command. I did the lieutenant. Now I'm just going to go be, be backseat guy and, and get to go on fires. And if you don't like it, you be chief, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate your insight. Yeah, it's awesome. So, yeah, I just got a few questions for you real quick, uh, Grant, uh, as we finish up here, man. First of all, kudos to you uh, having the white helmet and still wanting to get dirty and mix it up with the guys. Um, to me, like, that's that's what, you know, to, as chief officers, you, you want chiefs that are still firemen first, right, that still understand the job and are still willing to mix it up from time to time. So, man, like, that's that's awesome. I love that. I love to see more and more of that. You know, you mentioned some great chiefs earlier, uh, you know, with Shannon and and, and – you know, Kurt and those guys that, and, and just so many dudes that are, uh, Salzano, I mean, that are still mixing it up and, um, it's encouraging, right? Because 20 years ago, <laughs> I felt like that didn't happen as much, you know, no. there's still, there were some, but, but it seems like more and more, you're seeing more guys with white helmets, um, putting their gear on and, and getting ready to, to, to do work if necessary. And so, man, that's, that's uh, kudos to you for kind of setting the, the standard, the tone, if you will, for your guys so like, Hey, this is, you know, I, I would expect you guys to be in your gear, but I'm going to wear mine too. I'm going to put my gear on when I can and, and engage. And, you know, obviously we have different roles, but you're still a fireman at heart. And I, yeah, that's, that's what it, you know, we can hope for as a fire service that we get to the point where everybody from the chief down, you'd like to think still remembers what it's like to be tailboard, you know, riding irons, riding nozzle, whatever. Um, because I think we're all better for it when we are. Yeah. You know, my job is not to force the door. And if I pull up on scene and I'm forcing a door, Nobody is doing my job, but I'm doing somebody else's. Sure. So, uh, sure. you know, remaining disciplined as a chief to to keep my role, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's why I'll go to FDTN and have fun. And when I come back here, I'll be command. It's what I signed up for, and it's what yeah. they expect from me. But but you do got to put your gear on and, and train with the men so that you can uh, remember why we do this job. It's the best yeah. job in the world. Oh, absolutely. So uh, my first question, you know, you spent a long time uh, as lieutenant. 
uh, company officer level there. Um, what is, you know, if you had to pick one drill that it was kind of like your go-to favorite drill to run with your crew uh, as a company officer, what would it be? Ooh, I love doing a uh, forcible entry door. We got a woods door and we mm-hmm. put that in the bay um, and we'd run, uh, we'd run everybody through and we say, Hey, you got to do one, one person forcible entry and you can't use ads for anything. Everything's got to be forks, right? Cause typically the ads is for gapping, but sometimes the door forces on the gap, right? But if it doesn't, you need to know how to use the fork. So one man fork forcible entry. And then, uh, we get out the assault bike and we get out some kettlebells mm-hmm. and we just start running and, uh, you go from kettlebell farmers carry to the bike to force in a door and you got to go you know outward left hand uh inward left hand and then come back through the other way and then just just keep going and see how many doors you can get through um because it really shows that you need to have a grasp of the basics what you're doing but then you can see how stupid you get when you get uh mentally taxed or physically taxed your mind just starts to go so it's not a search drill uh, but that that's that's one of my favorite ones. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Um, so my second question is, if you had to pick one job on the fire ground, what job is it? To a, I task. love being a com- a task, you know, I probably search. Search. Be the officer on the search team, yeah. Yeah. And I can't tell you why, just because that's probably my comfort zone. And plus, I want to grab somebody, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I kind of had a feeling that would be the answer. I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so my last question i have is what do you feel is the biggest challenge facing the modern fire service in america mm. dang you gotta finish with a hard one i had to set you up with some easy ones shoot <laughs> uh dang I, I don't even know I think we've got a pretty good handle on sharing. I think, um, you know, maybe, maybe some of the, uh, we're some of our own worst enemies as far as, you know, NFPA. And I know the foams was a big deal and, and cancer is a huge deal in the fire service, but, um, you know, I think we make it tough on ourselves. We look at what we're doing with gear and I, I run our PPE program and you start looking at, it's like, we got to wash our gear, you know, several times, a several times a year. And we just got done. We just got done doing our gear cleaning and repair. And it, I could not believe what the bill was. So they say, wash your gear anytime you're in, in, in the dirty. And then we got to replace all of our seal tape. And then they're saying the gear is only good for, for 10 years to say, Hey, like, I don't have a very busy department. Our gear is way better than, you know, Detroit for, you know, one year gear in Detroit is way worse than our 10 year gear. Uh, and then you couple that with, uh, you know, the PFAS and, and, and just everything. I think sometimes we're our own worst me- enemy. It's like, is this a money grab uh, to try to get, you know, cancer money or something? Or are we really doing what's right? I mean, I don't think anybody set out with the intention to, to screw or give firefighters cancer, but as we see things, let's fix it. But I think there's got to be a balance between the uh, over NFPA and an over ISO and, and just some common sense, right? I, it takes me six months to get new gear now, but last week I got, you know, six sets that are taken out of service. I can't plan for that. And what do I do? Do I give them no gear as backup or is it better to have 11 year old gear until I can get new stuff? I don't know. You know, sometimes comments, maybe uh, the, the failure of having common sense is going to be the, the detriment to the fire service. Yeah, no, that, I, I feel that uh, in my soul, man. It, it is amazing uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, there's a lot of good things that have happened over the last, you know, two decades. But, man, I feel like in a lot of ways, you're, you're right. We're, we're our own worst enemies in a lot of ways. We have created um, so much red tape with stuff that it's almost to our detriment of performing our, our jobs. And, and I can tell you, like, so we just recently had, uh, an issue arise with guys wanting to work out in gear because of all the stuff with the, uh, you know, IFF suing NFBA and blah, blah, blah. And it's inconclusive, you know, PFAS, PFAS uh, in our gear and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it, it came down to like a whole safety health and safety committee. Like they, they put an end, like temporarily told people they couldn't work out in their gear, to, like minimize the amount of time they're in your gear. 
Uh, and then it came out discretionary. They discouraged the practice, but it's allowed. And long story short, um, I just got to thinking to myself, like, if we're not supposed to be in our gear, like only when we have a call or like, how are we supposed to get proficient and acclimate 100%. to that? You know what I'm saying? And so like, there's that balancing act of like, yeah. we have to, we're, we're supposed to be tactical athletes. We're supposed to be able to perform this environment, but, but then we're being told like, yeah, don't put it on unless you absolutely have to. I'm like, man, what are we, yeah, what are that, we doing that, to ourselves operationally? That's like telling the cops, right? Like, you can't wear your bulletproof vest unless you're in a shootout, and don't wear the gun because it tilts your hips to the right and it's going to screw up your back. Like, seriously? <laughs> like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Maybe you should just get better. And how do we get better if we can't be in the gear? And I'm not saying you wear dirty gear to go do your workouts, but you know what? All that old ten year old gear. Let everybody keep it, mark it with an orange spray paint, and that can be your that can be your your gear. You know how much you take nozzle forward, and how many knees do you get torn up? Use that gear for that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Keep your good stuff for the for the important times. But yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, dude. It's uh, it's been a fun it's been a fun conversation, man. I, I really uh, appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, really, really have enjoyed the conversation. Uh, you know, hopefully the listeners get something out of it. There's been a lot of good talk course with search and then just the balance and culture and paying it forward um it's always fun to do the rapid fire questions because it you know anybody that knows how the show's set up with like it's not scripted there's no and you know, we sean gets three questions i get three questions and it's just kind of organic um so i always enjoy those just because it is a very spontaneous uh yeah. answer and you know question and answer but uh it's been fun man it, it really has i i feel like i've got a, a whole page and a half worth of notes here just from listening to you guys talk um, and, and hopefully our, our folks listening will have the same. They'll take some little nuggets out of this and, and push them to be better. But at the end of the day, you know, train hard, love your people, love your family, you know, and, and use some common sense, right? Go out there and, and don't, uh, don't outsmart your common sense, you know, make, make a, an effort each shift to be a little bit better every single that's time it. you come to the firehouse. And, and you know, that's, that's it, man, is, is, pay it forward, you know, share that with other people. And, and you got a class coming up at FDIC, your hot class, uh, residential primary search, making the grab, right? What yep, day is, yep. what day is that, uh, going to be Monday, Monday and Tuesday? Uh, we're still at a four hour. We would have loved to do eight hours, but, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not really set up for that. Uh, FDIC is not set up for that as well. So, uh, sticking with the four hours and, uh, you know, th those guys have been with me for a long time and are just top shelf. I don't, I don't deserve to be in their presence. So, uh, I just am the train conductor and let them do their thing, which is cool. Um, so yeah, that's at FDIC and then doing the, doing the classroom again, uh, every year, the classroom changes a little bit. So, uh, if, if I sent you last year's PowerPoint, it's not going to be the same thing. So I still encourage you, please come. I don't want like two people in my room. <laughs> right? That's a little humiliating, but, um, you know, and, and I think that in the end, uh, just a couple of things, like if you get a grab, um, and you want to share the story, get a hold of me, uh, 239-898-0843 or grantschwalby at gmail.com. And we'll set it up, maybe not immediately, but I'll, we'll get to it in the in the next, you know, two to four weeks. And I'd love to just record that. And if you haven't heard the Grab This Podcast, go to there. It's 20, 30 minutes of a, just a grab story. And we try to share a little bit of the search culture from around uh, your department so people can get a little backstory. And it's not about being a hero. It's about, uh, you know, it's just about hearing what the, the story, what happened, you know? And the funny thing is like, when I talk to guys, I'm like, they're like, Hey, uh, I want to tell you about the grab story and see if it'd be good on the grabs. I'm like, that's not how this works. Like you just tell me you want to do it and we do it. I don't want to know a thing about it because otherwise it seems scripted. So yeah. when you listen, that's the first time I've heard it, which is cool. Um, and it's not about being a hero. It's just, just sharing your thing and trying to keep it very kitchen table. Like, um, and then, you know, the last thing is, is, you know, we talk about sharing information and I've had so many good dudes that have shared uh, their information with me. And so we put together maybe about six, seven years ago, we put together a manual um, that was kind of like, so our Astero fire manual, and that's how we throw ladders, how we do forcible entry, how we do, um, you know, how we do everything. And it was really inspired by Sean Wilson and what, what he had put out. Um, and, and in talking with Ben Schultz, uh, a buddy of mine, he teaches with us, but he's West Palm, you know, he moved from, from West Metro and he went to West Palm and he's like, Hey, you know, it's funny. I was like, you're on probation. All he was doing was studying. He's like, dudes study when they're on probation or when they want a promotion. So how stupid are we to give them dumb books to study? Maybe we should maximize that time and really give them a good sound document on what 
you expect from your department. Like if it's only the good stuff and they get good at that and everybody starts scoring hundreds, I think you're winning. So um, I'm willing to like so many people have shared with me. If you want a copy of that, I'll send it to you in Word and in PDF so you can just change out the pictures and make it your own. Um, and all I ask is anybody like you, you, you mock it up and make it better. Send me a copy because I'm going to steal some of your stuff. I mean, we're going to share it. Right. Um, so either way, uh, let's let's make this place better. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, yeah, check out uh, Grab's podcast, guys. Make sure you go check out Grant's. Uh, if you guys are going to FEIC, uh, if you can get in the hot class, man, it, it'll be well worth your time. And then uh, check out his class lecture. What day is your lecture at FEIC? I don't know. Okay. They haven't let us know yet, but we'll figure it out. Yeah, I try to remember. I, I think, yeah, I have to look back to my emails. <laughs> All I know is I had to I had to fix the the speaker agreement. So that's that was uh, apparently they sent the wrong one. Are those due already? I think they're. I think I got yeah. till the thirty first or something. Thirty yeah, first, buddy. Thirty first. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, we're we're uh, like I said, uh, I'm Nick. That's Sean Grant. Thanks for your time today. Um, hopefully, you guys enjoyed the podcast today. And uh, if you got any feedback, man, hit us up. Let us know. Uh, again. Hit up Grant if you got any questions. You want to send any documents there or any training material. But uh, that's it, fellas. I appreciate the time today. I know uh, you know it's always an honor to have guys like you on the show, Grant. Uh, like I said, you know, sharing knowledge and passion, man. That's what it's about. And uh, so certainly honored to have you here today. And hopefully we'll get this thing edited and sent out uh, by the end of the day. So cool. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Yeah, take, Thank you. Take care, brothers. <laughs>